and I'd suggest anyone do it, is when you're developing a trail, ride with someone adapt to cycling and you can see a whole different world. Like, I mean, they don't have the ability to get out and turn themselves around. I was you just know, gonna it, think, I was you know, just going to say, I mean, the flow's got to be a little bit different. Yeah. You can't just, you know, uh, we'll, we'll just bunny hop this and, you know, squeeze yeah, around you that. I mean, yeah, you have to think yeah, about you that. Can't, you can't do switchbacks. You're going to do roundabouts. We have a cycling roundabout, which is really cool. And for b beginning bicyclists, it provides them the safest step off of a paved trail they've ever met. And when pe people come off of that trail, the joy and hope on their face, you can feel it. Yeah. It's like, wow. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Aaron Hautala from the Cuyuna area in Minnesota, which is not far away from Brainerd, Minnesota. And uh, we are having a discussion about uh, a major cultural shift and change that they went through in that area when they transformed a large area that used to be uh, mining and uh, really turned it into a wonderful record recreational area and activity asset for the area, for the region, and many of the small towns in that area, and uh, really transformed into a culture of activities. So this is a fabulous success story for these small towns using physical activity and active mobility and riding bikes to help bring economic vibrancy to these communities. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Aaron. Aaron, it's such a pleasure to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me, John. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Hey, you know, <laughs> how cold is it up there? Oh, let's not talk about that. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. no. Today, Today's a heat wave. I'm not kidding. A, a heat, heat wave. wave. Yeah, it was 34 degrees. Oh, my gosh. That is a heat wave. I know. Snow was melting. Yeah. It was kind of felt like spring break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so why don't we do this to kick this off? Um, I'll have I'll just turn this over to you. Let you introduce yourself. Uh, tell the folks where you are located, and uh, then we'll dive in and talk a little bit about Cuyuna. Okay, sounds great, John. My name is uh, Aaron Hautala. I my story is based in Cuyuna. That's in Minnesota. It's a mountain bicycling destination currently, and it's growing into a paddle sport destination. We're the on the headwaters of the Mississippi River, which is pretty cool from a location standpoint. And the real brief story of Cuyuna is it was a iron ore destination, mining in World War One and Two, and then after the World Wars, there was opportunities to get minerals in different places in Minnesota that were uh, less difficult to get. So the mining moved on. And then it provided an opportunity of for the community from 1984 through today, really, to look at those open pits and to look at the resources and rethink it. And how can you take something that was man-made but turn it into a world-class, human-powered outdoor recreation destination? Fantastic. That is that is great. And I met you and, and ran into you when you were sort of telling the Cuyuna <laughs> yeah. story at a, a conference in San Antonio a couple of years ago. Uh, what was the name of that conference again? I think it was the National Bicycling Tourism Conference, if yes. I can remember. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah, so it was great. It was it was neat to like be brushing shoulders with a whole bunch of event coordinators and 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 different folks that uh, uh, you know welcome people into their communities and their regions and. Uh, uh, especially like, you know, some of the, the long bike rides, but then there was right. also, you know, uh, locations, you know, there were like, like Cuyuna and, and a few others where, uh, they were like welcoming people into their, their communities to do of all things, ride bikes. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. It was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it's interesting too. You, so you talk a little bit about uh, or you mentioned about the, the history of this particular property. Um, how, how big is this property? It's about 5,000 acres total. And it's it currently expanded a little to uh, Crowing County land. So it's about maybe 6,000 acres total, but it's not a huge chunk of land. And you're looking at the map currently and, and back in the mining days, which you know started in the 1900s through about 1984, all 
Not all, but a lot of those blue dots that look like lakes are the actual pits that were dug in the ground to extract the minerals to make steel, obviously. And then through time, when you turn the pumps off in a pit, water comes back. That's, you know, it wasn't rain, I guess. It was the actual water table filled it back up. And what's really cool about this now recreation destination is the cities of Crosby, Ironton, Cuyuna, um, Trommeld, Riverton, they were all built around the mineland because they walked to work basically. So it was really convenient to work there because you could walk to work, but what makes it outdoor recreation magic and I think just a golden formula is it's all right in and right out now because of where they mined, which is now outdoor recreation resource and where you stay. So it's like I've equated it to Summit County. Take all of what Summit County in Colorado is, but just make it tiny <laughs> and make it all right next to each other. So it's very easy. I mean, you park your car and then you really don't need it again until you leave. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So when we look at we're looking at this map, um, that sort of grid that you see there with the, the pink color is that are those like is that part of like a town is that the city streets yes, there yes okay exactly the on the on the southern side of that map where you see the grid work closest to the you know the brown area you can see that's ironton and then crosby is the grid work that goes alongside of the the natural lake called serpent and then if you look up in the upper right hand corner you can't really see it there's a green trail what looks like it's leading to nowhere. <laughs> and then it leads to a big yellow area. That's the city of Cuyuna. Ah, and then, okay. and then the actual grid work that's in the upper left-hand corner, that's the city of Trommeld. And then the little grid work that's on the far left kind of bottom, just above the brown area with the mine Lake Sagamore there, that's the city of Riverton. So you could wow. see all these little areas and what's, What's so amazing to live here is that you can cycle to any one of those, you know, and it's just, they're all interconnected via paved trail or via mountain bike trail. Right, and it, right. you can navigate the whole thing. So I, I've, I've been to Brainerd before uh, uh, visiting uh, Chuck Marone uh, with Strong Towns. Where is this in, in relationship to Brainerd? 18 minutes direct to the east of Brainerd. Okay, so it's to the east. Okay, very, very close. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, cool. So, this was circa when, when, when this all started. The whole idea for what this area would be, mm -hmm. 1984. It's from wow. from my from my, the people who were there. Yeah, <laughs> they're still. You know, thankfully we could still chat with them. But yeah, when the last mining truck left. Okay. It it was the moment of so what do we do? Right. And and there was a lot of different ideas ranging from well just sit and wait they'll be fine they'll come back to well we could be this to the brave and bold and what was considered crazy idea in eighty four was to have a silent sport destination for outdoor recreation. Okay. And, and what do you and mean was, by silent sport? Good question. Silent sport to the founders was hiking, walking, equestrian cycling paddling you know it just there wasn't per se a motor because that's what right. went into the actual management plan of this area was pretty much in the summer it was silent sports in the winter snowmobiles are and were allowed through on the mine lakes you can have a motorized boat but it, you have to keep it within a certain speed and certain horsepower so it doesn't turn into a you know it's not a jet ski destination if you will Right, right. Gotcha. So it was, you know, along the lines of let's try to mitigate the amount of noise pollution in this area. So try to lean yeah. into the, the silent sports. Got it. Yeah. And, okay. and the theory behind that, and I didn't know this, but I asked through the years and you got to think of this whole area as no trees, just red piles of dirt and holes in the ground. <laughs> That's all it was. Yeah. You know, there, there was no lakes yet because the water hadn't come up. The trees had not grown yet. But the people, the, it was women, I, I love saying it, it was women who led this forward and they wanted to do it to pre protect and preserve the land okay. because the, the land did mean something. It helped get through two world wars. It helped that community be what it was and they didn't want to see the land turn into a free-for-all 
or uh, do whatever you want. They really wanted to protect it as almost a monument of what this community actually did through its heyday of mining. And they wanted silent sports because it was less invasive on a fragile landscape because it's fragile because it was blown out of the ground and stacked in piles. Right. So you you can erode it pretty quickly, right. if you know what I mean. And yeah, that's yeah. why that wasn't that they were, you know, mountain bikers in 1984, is that they want they didn't want to see the overburdened piles turn into ruts and, you know, fall back into the ground and become unsafe. Yeah. But it was a perfect marriage of timing. <laughs> got it, got it. So, and then we fast forward to uh, 2013 and 2014. This trail map is, this concept map is from 2014. And uh, who, who's this uh, group of uh, gents here? Uh, uh, look, looking yeah. down at the map. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, well, in 2011, the first trails opened, which was 25 miles of majority two-way mountain bike trails. The paved trail had been constructed at that point, so there, that network was already there too. But we were at this point in the meeting having this audacious idea to, so what can we expand? And moments before this discussion, the, the answer was, we're done. There is no expansion. <laughs> but through time and we're through community. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was the first answer to expansion is, we're done. There was yeah. no more plant. It was 25 miles. You're done. And I, you know, that was something we had to work through. <laughs> but this is a meeting of the DNR, uh, Steve Weber, who was the park manager at that time. He's in the middle with the green khaki shirt. Father Clunker, Bruce Swanson, is in the yellow shirt. He was the vice president of the Cuyuna Lakes Mountain Bike Crew. Dan Hudson, who was with Imba Trail Solutions, is on the far left. And he's really the person to thank for that master vision because he put his heart and soul into that like you wouldn't believe. I'm the guy leaning over like my back is sore already. <laughs> <laughs> and Joshua Rebenak, who I always say, and he's tired of me saying it, but the brains of the operation because he's an engineer by trade as well. He's to, to my right in the black shirt. And then John Schaubach took the picture, which I didn't even know John was there, but I went through all these photos on the weekend and John was in another photo. So I know John was there and he took this photo. Right, right. Well, when, you, when you're behind the camera, you, sometimes you get forgotten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, here, here y'all are uh, on a precipice looking out. So talk yeah. a little bit about what, what's going on in this photo. Yeah, so this, technically, we call it the North Monoman unit now. I still call it the Morocco unit because that was the original name. But we're on an overlook that is just just underneath the overlook that's now there on the Cinture Trail. And this is the very first time that we had the DNR staff out there to say, what if? <laughs> what if we were able to expand trail out here? And what Nick Stotts, he's the one with the orange shirt on the far Right, he is now, he's a DNR employee now. He's a trail maintenance specialist, but he's pointing back to where all the 25 miles of current original trails are. So you can see that what looks like a mountain range, it's overburdened piles with trees now, but you know, that's the former tailings or not tailings, but the overburden, it was a waster that they couldn't turn into steel. That's where the 25 miles of trail were at that point and we were to the north of it. And that's why it's called the North Monoman unit now. And Nick is pointing at the South Monoman unit. And again, it was, I was told in the beginning that we'd never have trail out here. It would never happen. We don't have access. And then just last week, the North Monoman unit was finally finished where the DNR connected, reconnected two lakes that had been disconnected during a road during the mining era, put in a bridge for pedestrians and cyclists, and now has a crowned like gem and jewel of that whole unit. Wow. So it, it's pretty, these kind of photos help you appreciate how far we came from yeah. to get, get to where we are today. So you and mentioned that, the original 25 miles. Yep. So, and then this was the, uh, the concept map from 2014. Um, how how true to this concept map um, is the final built out version and how many total miles are we uh, talking about now? The, the total mileage right now is about 70 miles of one way, one direction, single track. Unidirection, wow. I guess I could call that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was told that recently. That's unidirection error. Yeah. You don't have to say one way. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, what what hasn't completed is only two things. 
and there's a section on the Paradise Point, which the DNR does not have land access to, that could develop an expert trail center right within the rally center, kind of in the middle of the whole thing. Okay. And then, and then there's a, a unit called the Black Hoof unit, which is to the south of it. It, it, I, I'd point at it, but I can't. Right, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's kind of in that same rally center zone. And then there was a desire for the North Monoman unit to have a much larger loop, but due to private land holding still being private, that wasn't possible. Okay. And and what I tell people is, you know, at this point, I don't know that those developments will be for cycling. You right, know, right. there's a, there's a chance they could be for hiker specific trails okay, and maybe, and maybe should be because 70 miles a single track is a lot when the hikers have zero miles for, for what they have, or maybe they will turn into adaptive trails to give our adaptive cyclists more miles. You know, when you get to 70, you start rethinking, okay, what are we doing and why are we doing it? You know, right. right. And it's, it's a nice place to be, or it might be nothing. It might be just what it is today. We'll see. Right. So you've mentioned the Minnesota DNR a, a couple of times, the Department of Natural Resources, and uh, you talked a little bit about land, some of the land being private and some of the land being public land or DNR land. Uh, how, When we look at this complex, the entire area here, how many acres are, are we talking about? And then how many acres is actually left that's developable into uh, into trail systems? That's a great question. It's it's 5,000 acres, kind of like the whole area where most of the water is and where you see most of the trails. Now, if you get rid of those holes in the ground, or which are now mine lakes, you have about 2,500 2, acres, of which that's really kind of what we were able to develop or look at. But I mean, it starts to shrink incredibly fast from there. Right. I think when, when you actually take what you could develop on because of private holdings, because it's a rec area, state managed, it has boundaries, but believe it or not, there's still private land holdings, ownings within it. Because wow. when, mi okay. when, when mining ended, mining said, we don't want it, we'll sell it. And immediately, well, different people could buy different things. And it didn't become a state rec area till many years later. And the state has, for now decades, acquired parcels to make it whole, but they still have more work to do. When you remove the water, and then if you take out the private land owning holdings, all the trails currently in a where the way they flow are about you know seven hundred acres of land that we're currently yeah. working in. So yeah. it it sounds massive. But when you break it down, it's like, it is not massive. Right, right. But you, it's still you have quite to, impressive for 70 yeah. miles of, of single track. So right. to your point earlier. So that's, that's really fascinating. Talk about the original vision and especially back in, in 2013, 2014. And what was like the timeline and, 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 you know, I, I, all, all Whenever you have a project like this, there's there's like, you know, scoping and you're like, oh, OK, well, this is going to take X number of years to yeah. build out. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the first part was even how do you. I just started shooting off at the hip because <laughs> I didn't know how to move anything forward. And I learned real quickly, you're never going to do anything without a plan. And kind of the most important thing we ever did was to sit down, work with the land manager, work with the county, work with IMBA, work with IMBA Trail Solutions to put together what a plan could be. Because the state couldn't move anything forward on a whim. That wasn't going to happen. And then at, at the same time, we went from kind of purpose-built trail system to purpose-built town. And how can this outdoor recreation destination help build the downtown because from that point in my career i was coming out of a downhill ski culture where we would go skiing but kind of the most fun was after skiing and, and staying in the village and just hanging out in the village and having fun and we started to transition our conversation as a mountain bike club with our community to say and how do we build out the village how do we make this the best possible experience on trail on water and in town and that started a pretty robust discussion of why do we need that and how important is that? But we uh, worked together to uh, to figure that out and to put a plan together to 
build economy because if you know if this money no one gives money just to build bike trails usually they don't do it just because it's a good old time they do it because they have certain expectations of what those bike trails might be and going back from when i first started helping with the crew in the community it was 2011 through today we're now well over 30 new businesses that have started and it's not just all cycling specific businesses i'm proud to say that like we got one of the coolest brand new grocery stores in our community that no town our size should have. <laughs> and the locals love it. You know, not every local is going to look at a bike business and go, oh, I'm so excited. I can go get a bike I don't want. You yeah. know, but when all of a sudden they have, you know, brand new Super One grocery store that is just perfect for them and they have a better variety, a better pricing. Okay, now it makes sense. <laughs> I right. like this. Yeah. Or yeah. when they, Ace Hardware came back to town because now there was reason to be here and they can get their hardware without having to drive out of town. I mean, that's a big deal. And then like you're showing, these are the cycling specific videos where the, the pink roof one was uh, Victual mm -hmm. and they have, the, they have the best one thing of everything you never knew you needed until right. you walk in the store. This one, it's yeah. Like, yeah, it's just like a highly curated experience that you would never would have thought about until you walk in there and then all of a sudden you have a serious problem and you have to buy it all because <laughs> it's, so, it's so cool. Yeah. And, and then the next one that was on there was Hudson, which was a new bike cafe basically mm -hmm. that opened, but it isn't biking only. A lot of Ironton locals I see in there enjoying it because it's their space. You know, it's our space. It's not siloed to one user group. And what's cool about it is they have garage doors on either side so you can ride your bike right through park it inside and ride out the other side if you want. So it's wow. doing, yeah. a, doing a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Doing a little different. And so that those, most of those photos were those uh, from the, the different towns or was that from Ironton? Crosby Ironton is a okay. lot of what we're showing there, but everything happened in Crosby first because it looked like it was the most ready to go. Now Ironton is actually the closest to the trailhead and now Ironton's starting to happen with the donut shop, with the bike cafe, a new restaurant started, a candy shop is opening. And now Deerwood's getting into the action and they're the farthest way away from the whole town. They're connected via paved trail. Okay. But now they have a brand new dental office that is just incredible. They're, they redid their, the, you know, like the old motor lodges when they redo them and make them cool. That right, happened. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's nice. going to be a, a new clinic in Deerwood. So you're seeing like, okay, it's expanding out way outside of our immediate impact yeah and that's so, and this is the the website uh, kayona.com and there's some we had to play this because there's some really cool uh, winter cycling video here uh talk a little bit about you know this branding and uh and, and this whole concept it's the same uh, same you know logo that you're wearing on your your vest there yeah well the whole concept behind kayona.com was i was at eurobike a key presenter, keynote presenter in their travel thing in Europe on Cayuna. And then I had a I had a person from Scotland and then a person from Morocco. And they all asked me, so how do I get to Cayuna? How do I do it? And I didn't have an answer. <laughs> and I'm in communication. Right. I do this for a living. And I, I didn't have anything to share with them. So I we came back and built Cayuna.com to provide the answer to people of how to get here, how to do it, how to have an experience and how to have a great time because we know how. Right. So why wouldn't we tell everybody else how? Right. And right. and the, the, <laughs> the winter side of it is because uh, maybe people aren't familiar with Minnesota. No, they are. <laughs> and they know we have winter and they, they probably think we have polar bears. We don't, <laughs> right. but we do, we do have winter and I will say it here and I've said it for 10 years. If there's anything we can own, yeah, it's winter, right. yes. <laughs> and yes. and we and we can prove that we can make winter incredibly fun, and that video kind of shows it. Like yeah. we we know we know how to have fun, not just get through. Yeah. So you you mentioned it's kind of in your wheelhouse of of what you do <laughs> professionally. So right, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your your day job and what you're what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm a advertising agency owner, if that's what we want to call it, you know, communication, public relations of Stratelligent, and we help local communities, basically rural. They're always rural, it seems, but give a rural community the support and strength they need from a communication, planning, and development point of view that 
they don't usually get. And now yeah. it's turned into, due to Cuyuna, a lot more economic development through outdoor recreation, where communities are calling us into their county or into their town to say, hey, we're at the front end of this, and can you help us? And I can. And the cool news is there's one county we're helping in Minnesota where we're not doing anything mountain biking. We're developing completely different outdoor recreation because that's what their land provides and that's what their people and their visitors want. So it doesn't have to be mountain biking, right. but the same pro process and principle apply, you know, and that's, it's been a fun, it's been a very learning experience. You know, it's like, there's no real, if you find the book on how to do this, send it to me. Otherwise right. it feels like kind of writing it as we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So one of one of the things that I think is so incredibly important and and yes, we we we, uh, we start off our conversation, um, as, as Chuck would say, uh, by talking about the weather. That's a good Midwestern thing to do is to talk about the weather right off the, yeah. the off the front. And and so, yeah, I mean, some of these images of, uh, you know, being out there in the environment, in the snow, I mean, it's just a matter of wearing the right type of clothing. And that's kind of the joke that we talk about at Active Towns all the time with active mobility is that there is no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad clothing. I mean, you you can, if it's the snow is flying or if it's a chilly day, it's fine. Dress appropriately yeah. and go out and have a good time. I'll talk yeah. a little bit about this, you know, this concept of, you know, this area being such a, a driver for economic vitality and vibrancy and the fact that it doesn't just shut down in the wintertime. Right. And the reason why it doesn't shut down is because we don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> so so we had to make it vibrant year round. And that's the goal. It's like, how do you find the best possible experience regardless of the season? And for that winter cycling, I mean, when we started it off, we didn't have trail that looks like that. I mean, that is groomed single track through mechanical devices that did not exist 12 years ago. And our mountain bike club was faced with, uh, we had snowshoers packing snow, and that was going to work for about four miles of trail. And we said, hey, we want 40. Because right. <laughs> cause we want to ride it all ourselves, yeah. you know, and, and we want other people to come too. And we had to innovate and develop strategies and equipment that did not exist. And the DNR, give them credit. They let us do it. They worked with us to allow it because they, in the beginning, they said no motorized grooming. Uh, and, okay. and, and if that's the future, we're not doing anything. Yeah. But then... We, Again, working together, building relationship, building clarity and understanding, we were we were able to do it and develop. Because if you don't have a groomed trail in the winter, nobody's coming because right. you, you can't ride it. Yeah. And, and I'm pausing on this this particular photo because I think it, it speaks to the other side, which is uh, the importance of engaging entire families. Yeah, you hit it on the head there. And that was we were criticized for that in the beginning that we built out Cuyuna to be so beginner, <laughs> you know, why so much beginner trail? Well, right. because it was to build economics. It was to be a place where the strider bike through the mom or dad could find the trail either together yeah. or on their own. And yeah. as we built out that 70 miles, we aired on building the expert trail we did not have. Right. And now, and now, 10 years later, we have a well-rounded experience that honestly still leans beginner on yeah. purpose. And we're yeah. proud of that. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. when, it, when it's used as an insult, we go, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in, in my yeah. world, it's what we, we call, you know, building an environment for all ages and abilities. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. it's just like with gravel cycling. You know, I mean, the beauty of gravel cycling is you don't have to do anything. You just have to put a route together. Right. You just need gravel. Yeah. And our neighbor, our neighbors to our east, Aiken, in Aiken County, has in Minnesota probably the lion's share of gravel roads. So we yeah. have a 40, 75, and 100-mile gravel century route that we didn't have to do anything other than record a ride with GPS route. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, yeah. that'll work. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. And, and, and I'm going to pull up a couple more uh, family photos here, too, because... I, I think that this is, you know, one of the things that we can do in our communities is look at ways where we can engage entire families through active mobility and active living 
and, you know, normalizing, you know, for, for the entire family of getting on a bike and, and it doesn't have to just be for recreation it, but the more right. often that you, and the more comfortable you get on a bike, the, the more that you're able to bleed this through. And you had mentioned it earlier too, for those people who are like living in these towns, in these areas, they can literally ride to the trailhead from their door, yeah. from their house, you know, from their actual doorstep. Right. Yeah. And uh, what we're seeing now with uh, our Sagamore adaptive cycling trails. So they're, they're built for the adaptive cycles, the three to four wheel cycles, which is great because up to this moment, we had zero miles for them. Now they have seven plus miles and bicyclists are obviously allowed on it too. And, and this trail footprint is allowing families to recreate together. When I say families, I'm not talking mom and kids. I'm talking grandparents, mom and kids. And the grandparents are allowed because they exist and they're really cool. They can do the pedal assist e-bicycles. So the grandparents can hammer out seven miles without sweating it. And they're riding with the grandkids that can do it as well. And they're in one place where three generations can actively recreate together. That's magic. That's the secret sauce right there. Yeah, if you're no, looking for it. Absolutely. And I, and I think that this also fits into that category of all ages and abilities, because again, as yeah. you mentioned, all ages, the grandparents can be doing this as well as because of the, you know, what we're seeing with the adaptive cycling here, truly all abilities as well. Yeah. And now, and, and talk a little bit about the specifics of this type of trail, because I think that this is a, a, a different footprint, a little bit wider in, in oh, the yeah. trail, correct? Oh, yes. The uh, the true like green, well, we have white circle adaptive and green circle adaptive. And it's probably four feet wide. Okay. Because it, ha it has to be. Yeah. I mean, the, the bicycle, the tricycle, the quadcycle, the adaptive cycle is much wider. And if it isn't, it's not safe for them, right. you know, and it, it was really, and I'd suggest anyone do it is what, when you're developing a trail, ride with someone adaptive cycling and you can see a whole different world. Like, I mean, they don't have the ability to get out and turn themselves around. I was you just know, gonna, it, think, I was you know, just it's, gonna say, I mean, the flow's gotta be a little bit different. Yeah. You can't just, you know, ah, we'll, we'll, we'll just bunny hop this and, you know, squeeze yeah, around that. I mean, yeah, you have to think yeah, about you that. Yeah, can't, you can't do switchbacks. You're gonna do roundabouts. We have a cycling roundabout, which is really cool. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, for yeah. Be beginning bicyclists, it provides them the safest step off of a paved trail they've ever met. And when pe people come off of that trail, the joy and hope on their face, you can feel it. Yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. So one of our biggest challenges is, is really making sure that riding a bike is not just a dude activity is getting more and more women, you know, right. engaged in doing this. And, you know, here we are two dudes talking about this, <laughs> but uh, you, you sent through a whole bunch of photos of, of women cycling. Why, why is this significant for Cuyuna? Because women do it <laughs> and they deserve it. I mean that like, it isn't just a guy sport. Yeah. And it's not just a Caucasian sport. It's an everybody sport. And what we learned real quickly is if we want women in Cuyuna, we want families in Cuyuna, we want multi-ethnic groups in Cuyuna. And the best way to help communicate that is to show them in Cuyuna, you know, yeah. and we really wanted to photograph them. You know, I don't care who them is, just we, we want them to show them having their experience because that's, that's what we want. And it's it's bringing all people together, really, and having there's different trails for every one of them. And they get to create their experience. You know, we're not going to tell them how to do it. We're going to provide the portfolio. Here's the options. Right. Now choose your own adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's good stuff. What have we not talked about yet that you think we, we should cover? That's a great question. <laughs> I think you've actually covered a lot of it. I mean, the, the main question I usually get asked is, well, how do I do this in my town? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it, it takes persistence and it takes relationship yeah. and it doesn't have to take decades of time, but it might. But if you're not building relationships with everybody, 
if you have silos, it won't work. You have yeah. to reach, you have to, I call it the silo busters. You know, you got to get the chamber out of their silo, the economic development out of their silo, yeah, city yeah. council out of their silo, county commissioners out of their silo. Yeah. I, even, you know, different user groups that you might not agree with. Yeah. You yeah. got to get out of our silos and it's like, okay, here's our hands. Now, how do we do this? Because <laughs> yeah. if you're not working together, someone's working against you and it won't happen. And right. you're far better off to work together. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It, ta- it, it takes time. It's harder, but it works. Right. You know, and, yeah. and none of us should be, and we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. None of us should be going after a land grab. Well, we got to beat so-and-so to the punch here. Right. It's like, that's a wrong goal. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. is not what, you know, outdoor recreation should be about. It's, it should be about people recreating, even if they don't have a tool to do it on. Right. Yeah. Why do you have to buy something to recreate? You shouldn't have to buy a thing. You should be yeah. able to sit there and enjoy it. So one of the things that 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 I try to emphasize uh, with the Active Towns podcast and in and, and the Active Towns movement is the fact that uh, there should be a nice uh, transition of you know recreational cycling facilities and the blending of. Uh, active mobility and using a bike to to you know meet our daily needs and you've mentioned it a couple of times where yeah it's convenient we can literally just ride from our doorstep and, and go out talk a little bit about that because i think that oftentimes there in in certain cities you know you, you get oh well that's just the recreate that's just for recreation right it, 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 we drive everywhere else for everything Talk a little bit about that and how we we can hopefully you know marry the two of of yeah it's it's way easier to just jump on the bike and you know go go as a family to to school to work to the restaurant yeah. um, and, and being able to seeing bikes as something more than just recreation right and that that's a hundred percent right <laughs> because even in our own town it was uh, i was at a people for bikes conference in indianapolis and it was positioned of how are you providing active transportation via walking or bicycle or wheelchair to your community regardless of your outdoor recreation and that's what we're currently working with the city of crosby and ironton is developing um basically recommended routes for people to get to the grocery store to go to the doctor to get to the dentist to yeah if they want to hit the paved trail they can yeah if they want to go on the mountain bicycle trail they can and in the early beginning there was some feedback of well nobody locally is going to do that but as soon as we actually made our sidewalks i think they were before eight feet wide and now they're about 12 or 14 feet wide all of a sudden you see you start to see locals using it when they had a safe protected route right because if you don't yeah you can ride on the state highway to get to the hospital i might need the hospital if i ride on the state highway right, right. you know and then once you provide a recommended designated signed this is where we want you to be it's magical how they show up and use it, (laughs) you know, and it has to be safe because if it's not safe, people won't use it. You know, just because you have a, a, you know, a Chevron painted on the road doesn't mean it's safe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it gets touchy because people are like, well, how there's no end to what you need. And I said, well, it's not just me. There's other people that don't have the ability to even own a car. Right. Yeah, I mean, are are we considering them? Because yeah. we should be. I mean, there's people that might not have enough money to own a bike, right? But could they walk it? Right, right. You know, yeah. and well, if the answer is yeah, I, and 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 to your point from earlier too is with the development of some of the additional trails as being walking only trails and hiking trails, uh, opportunities to be able to get into nature are you know it's it's critical for for health and well-being and and being able to have access especially if you happen to live in one of these towns to uh, a rich experience of you know getting into nature especially uh, a nature such as this that's healing healing from yeah. being previously you know a mind site so it's that's pretty uh, impressive 
So one of the things that I noticed is that when we were looking at that map of all the different lakes, that there's some potential, you know, water recreation uh, potential too. Uh, yeah. I'm going to pull up a, um, a, a, a video here um, and, and press play, but I'm not going to turn the sound up. I'll just let you sort of, you know, talk through this because the map is going to come up and you can kind of narrate, uh, you know, what, what's going on here and what's the, what's the opportunity that exists in Cuyuna of activating this, the water space? Yeah. So right now we have, I mean, I think there might be 20 mine lakes. I could be wrong on the total number, but uh, with a couple little portages, and signs as to say where to go and where you'll go, we could end up connecting pretty much all of those mine lakes together into a, at least a full day, if not a multiple day paddle portaging adventure zone. And again, the big one in Minnesota that has the national to international street cred is the Boundary Waters up in right. Ely. Yeah. And I, people know what that is. Well, yeah. welcome to the baby Boundary Waters. This is a little mini me little cutie pie yeah but for you know do a straw poll there's a lot of people that aren't going to want to wander all the way into the back country of the boundary waters they won't not as their first step but they could do this and guess what they'll have cell phone reception throughout it they can connect to social media they're within town i mean they're they're almost in city limits still so if they want to get back in the same day or get you know a cocktail later they can but they will have a similar I'm out there with wilderness and what that does, it's I call that area, our rec area, my behavioral health coach. It allows you to reset. Yeah. And we have too much stress growing on us for too many reasons. And if we don't find ourselves and reset and exercise our body, it isn't good for the human race, <laughs> physically yeah. or emotionally. Yeah, And yeah. that's another opportunity where now you could do you could ride 70 miles a single track. You could go on a 100-mile gravel ride, and you could do a multi-day paddle portaging adventure in the same area, and you're still in the same area. Right. You don't have to go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. And I see here a, a question. Uh, specific yeah. trails could be a possibility as well. Yeah, it's finding the right route because, yeah, you could give them a trail, but is it a good trail? You right. know, we don't just want to yeah. provide a trail. And what I'm learning about equestrian is they, you know, they want to do a loop. They don't want to just go two miles to a dead end and come back and look at the same thing. Correct. <laughs> yes. Just just like me, honestly, yeah. on cycling. So it's like, how do you how do you provide each user group the best possible experience and have all of the user groups working together for good. So one one group doesn't negatively impact another user group. Yeah. And that's the hardest possible work you could do. But when you do it, sit back and watch it grow like crazy. Yeah. Because people yeah. people are finding themselves in it and they'll love it. Yeah. And so here here's the call to action because uh, it sounds like the, there's a lot of work yet to be yeah. done in this area. So folks uh, can email at info at and uh, uh, you all will get them connected. And, I'll and get them connected. Find out a way to help out. Yeah, it's all, vol I mean, the state helps a lot. Without the state, it wouldn't exist. But the state requires, it's a good word, requires volunteer support. Right. Like you, you don't get something unless you give something. Yeah. It's not what, what can Cuyuna do for you? It's what you can do for Cuyuna. And yeah. if you're really into this paddle portaging and that's what you want to be a part of, I'll get you connected and yeah. you can help make it happen. Cause that's yeah. how Cuyuna or works. Or equestrian or the yeah, hiking trails. All of them. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. It's pe people power in the best possible way. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Talk a little bit about how this has helped transform the uh, the environment and and i i talk about a culture of activity a lot and i talk about how uh, cities and towns and and communities can can absolutely shape their the the trajectory of their community and uh and 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 transform the culture of the area into being a, a culture that, you know, does embrace physical activity and active mobility and, and things of that nature. Talk about the transformation that's uh, taken place, you know, over the last 20 years in this area. Well, I think the, the best example to answer that is in the beginning, there were probably less than, 
this many cyclists here. <laughs> you know, there was a handful that really loved it and had amazing vision and got it rolling. And now the Kaina Lakes mountain bike crew alone has over 300 active members or 300 members and probably 100 active members. So you talk about an exponential growth. And then outside of, I mean, you take a 60 mile radius of Cuyuna and Brainerd, uh, Cross Lake, Breezy Point, Bemidji. I mean, it's impacted all these different areas. And from a, from a community wellness point of view, it it's incredibly hard to tell anybody, go be active. You'll like it. Right. You know, it doesn't it doesn't work. Right. But what 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 cycling, at least in my opinion, everyone has their own and they're allowed it, but like on these adaptive trails, that really provides an opportunity for a quality of people can try it. And if you don't have the leg power in the beginning, you can try an e-bike. And if you have that experience and and don't like it, that's okay too, but I think, I think a large percentage of people might come out of that experience and go, "Well, that's not what I thought it would be. I kind of like that, actually." Yeah, you know, and that's how it starts. I mean, that's how it started for me. It was I had that a little adrenaline rush on a mountain bike that reminded me of downhill skiing. I have not touched my skis since 2011. Okay, they're still in the same spot because I took all that energy and put it into how do we make that here? Right. It's different, but how do we make it here? And the main thing I caution everyone is like, if, if you're looking to do anything like this, it's not about replacing or displacing or changing. It's about how do we together make this happen? You right. know, and it's not about creating an us and them. It's about creating a we, right. you know, and, and that's the real thing. And it's hard. It's not an easy thing to do, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, but if you go into it with that filter and frame, you're going to have a better chance of achieving real results and sustainable results versus a flash in the pan. And what we didn't want this to be was one chapter that had a beginning, a glorious midsection, and then an end because <laughs> right. yeah. we have had too many of them already. Yeah, yeah You know, yeah. it's like, and this isn't the deal. This is not the thing. Yeah. But it's a supportive thing that can make healthcare better, that can make education better, that can make our you know major manufacturing stronger, and give this a place that people want to live, but not get so out of control that they have to move because they can't afford to live. That's not right. the goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the goal. You know, so it's complicated, but it's yeah. you know as as folks approach this, be thoughtful about it and and be kind. <laughs> well, and and I I like to to you know frame this too that it's uh, you you mentioned that you know in the beginning there was like you know x number of quote unquote cyclists and yeah. you know you've been successful when uh it, it becomes just a normal activity for entire families to do yeah. and they wouldn't identify themselves mm -hmm. as cyclists they would just say no we're just people and we enjoy you know riding a bike we enjoy yeah. getting on our bikes as a, as a family as a family unit and and doing stuff and you know when it's you know when it's safe and inviting as you mentioned earlier you know we'll we'll get on our bikes and we'll do that for a utilitarian trip you know we'll ride in the summertime to the ice cream shop or something yeah you know, that sort of of thing where it, it's not a, an us versus them it's like oh no this is just like it's inclusive of everybody in the community all ages right. and abilities yeah and that's where families help create that i think yeah because yeah. it's hard to argue families having fun right. <laughs> it's like yeah. what part of that don't we like yeah, what, yeah, yeah. And, and what people have seen is that there was i would I, I think decades is a fair word where decades of people left and didn't come back and then all of a sudden now they want to get back right and, I, and i'm hearing people say you know thank you I grew yeah. up here. This is what, this is what we all felt it could be. Right. Thank you. And I'm like, a resurging pride. I like this. This yeah, will work. Yeah. That's good you know? stuff. And that's that's bigger than bike trails. That's a, creating a sense of place and a sense of peace. Yeah. And yeah, it's you're yeah. always rowing the boat, though. You can never take a day off. By the way. <laughs> that, yes, absolutely. I, I try to emphasize that uh, with folks around the globe as well. Is that you know this is 
this is hard work. This is not a sprint. It's definitely yeah. longer than a marathon too. <laughs> if you yeah. use a, a running a event analogies, this is like a, a, a never ending uh, ultra marathon. So just keep moving yeah. one foot in yeah. front of the other. So good stuff. Aaron, thank you so much for uh, joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such yeah. a joy to connect with you. Well, thank you for making time for me. And I'm very grateful to see you again and spend some time with all y'all. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Aaron. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell right next to it. Uh, that way you can customize your notification preferences. And I'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Also sending out a very big thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, the YouTube Super Chats and Super Thanks, as well as buying things from the Active Towns store and making donations to the nonprofit. Every little bit helps and is greatly appreciated. Thank you all so very much.